We're going to continue looking at exchange rate determination, this time we're focusing on the Mundell-Fleming model, which uses the assumption of fixed prices. First, let's have a look at the Marshall-Lerner condition. So what are the effects of a real depreciation in the current account? Usually, a real depreciation means that there is an improvement in the current account, since exports are relatively cheaper, and hence exports increase. However, as we will find out shortly, this assumption depends on the response of export and import volumes to real exchange rate changes. The value of the current account in domestic currency is given by the following equation, where P is the domestic price of exports in domestic currency, P star is the foreign price of imports in foreign currency, E is the nominal exchange rate, and X and M are the volume of exports and imports, respectively. This equation can then be manipulated to give the current account in terms of the real exchange rate Q. It can be seen that the change in the current account is affected by two different effects, a price effect and a volume effect. Given that a real depreciation implies delta Q over Q is greater than zero, then minus delta Q over Q is less than zero, so a real depreciation deteriorates the current account. Contrastingly, a real depreciation results in domestic goods being cheaper, so the volume of exports increases and foreign goods become more expensive, so the volume of imports decreases. Thus, this means the current account in volume improves. So we can see that there are two opposing forces, with the price effect being negative and the volume effect being positive, so the total impact will depend on the relative size of both effects. If the volume effect is greater than the price effect, then the current account will improve. Equivalently, if we were to divide both sides by delta Q over Q, we get that the sum of the elasticities of exports and imports, given by e to x and e to m, is greater than 1. This is known as a Marshall Lerner condition. However, if the sum of the two elasticities is less than 1, then a real depreciation will lead to a deterioration in the current account. The evolution of the current account following a real depreciation of the exchange rate is illustrated by the J-curve and shows how, in the short run, the Marshall Lerner condition generally does not hold because the price effect dominates the volume effect. However, in the long run, the condition holds and there is an appreciation in the current account, leading to a surplus. So let's look at one of the main models in exchange rate determination, the Mundell-Fleming model. Our first assumption is that the AS curve is perfectly elastic, meaning that prices are fixed and that aggregate demand is used to determine the level of economic activity. Our second assumption is to do with the balance of payments. PPP doesn't hold even in the long run, and the size of the current account surplus depends positively on the real exchange rate E and negatively on real income Y. Note that the second equality arises because given fixed prices, real and nominal exchange rates are identical. We also assume the Marshall Lerner condition holds. Now, looking at the capital account, first we assume that exchange rate expectations are static. Secondly, we look at capital mobility. If there is perfect capital mobility, then the UIRP condition always holds, and given that expectations are static, domestic interest rate R is equal to foreign interest rate R star. If there is imperfect capital mobility, flows of capital depend on interest rate differentials between countries. Combining these things, we create a balance of payments relation where the flow of capital finances the current account deficit or absorbs the surplus. In the case of perfect capital mobility, we can see that the balance of payments curve is flat. With imperfect capital mobility, the balance of payments curve is no longer flat. If there is a depreciation in the exchange rate from E0 to E1, the balance of payments curve shifts down from BBE0 to BBE1. Note how our definition of exchange rate means that E falls in the case of an appreciation and increases in the case of a depreciation. So at the given level of income Y0, a depreciation in the exchange rate means that there is an improvement in the current account, and so to stay balanced, the capital account has to become more negative. Assuming foreign interest rate stays the same, the domestic interest rate falls from R0 to R1 at this given level of output. So what are the key things in this model? There is an external equilibrium where the balance of payments is equal to zero, and an internal equilibrium where the goods and money markets are in equilibrium. There are three endogenous variables, the real interest rate R, real income Y, and the type of exchange rate regime assumed, whether it's floating where the nominal exchange rate E adjusts in order to maintain the balance of payments in equilibrium, or fixed, where the central bank has to intervene to maintain the nominal exchange rate fixed. So now that we've understood the basics of the model, let's look at analysing the effects of monetary and fiscal policies depending on the exchange rate regime and the degree of capital mobility. 
So what are the effects of the monetary expansion and the floating exchange rates and imperfect capital mobility? We start at point zero, where the balance of payments is at BP equals zero, and assume that the current end capital accounts are both equal to zero. There is also equilibrium in the closed economy, since ISE zero is equal to LFM zero. A monetary expansion means that there is an increase in money supply from M0 to M1, which leads to a shift right in LM from LM M0 to LM M1. So we have moved to point 1, where there has been a fall in interest rate from R0 to R1. The income has increased from Y0 to Y1. The fall in interest rate means that there is a deterioration in the capital account, and the increase in income means that there is also a deterioration in the current account. Thus, the balance of payments is now less than 0, and so we have moved up the BP line. The fall in interest rate means that the return on domestic investment has fallen, and so there is an excess supply of domestic currency. This leads to the domestic currency depreciating, and so E increases from E0 to E1. This then affects both the IS and BP curves. Exports are now cheaper, so there is an improvement in the current account, which means that the IS curve shifts right from IS E0 to IS E1, and the BP curve shifts down from BP E0 to BP E1. This moves us from point 1 to point 2, where income has increased from Y1 to Y2, and interest rate has also increased from R1 to R2. This means that there is an improvement in the capital account and a worsening in the current account. So from our initial position, the interest rate has fallen from R0 to R2. To look at the overall effect on the current account, we look at the capital account first, which has deteriorated, since now it is negative and at the start it is equal to 0. This means that for the balance of payments to remain equal to 0, the current account has to improve from zero to greater than zero to offset the fall in the capital account. So overall, we have seen a depreciation in the nominal exchange rate, an increase in the level of income, a fall in the real interest rate, and an improvement in the current account. Now let's look at the effect of a monetary expansion while still under floating exchange rates, yet now under the assumption of perfect capital mobility. This means that the BP curve is flat and we start at point zero, where the IS and LM curves are also in equilibrium. A monetary expansion again means that there is an increase in money supply from M0 to M1, so this leads to a shift right in LM from LM M0 to LM M1. And so we move to point one, where there has been a fall in interest rate from R to R1, and an increase in income from Y0 to Y1. The fall in interest rate means that there is a deterioration in the capital account increase in income means that there is also a deterioration in the current account. Thus, the balance of payments is now less than zero, so we have moved off the BP line. The fall in interest rate means that the return on domestic investment has fallen, so there is an excess supply of domestic currency. This leads to domestic currency depreciating, and so E increases from E0 to E1. This causes IS to shift right from IS E0 to IS E1. This moves us to point two, where the interest rate has returned to its original level and income has increased from Y1 to Y2. Since there is no overall change to the interest rate, the capital account remains the same, and therefore for the balance of payments to still equal zero, the current account doesn't change either. So overall, we have seen a depreciation of the nominal exchange rate, an increase in the level of income, no change in the real interest rate, and no change in the current account. Now let's move on to seeing the effect of the fiscal expansion under floating exchange rates and imperfect capital mobility. We start at point zero, and a fiscal expansion means that government spending increases from G0 to G1, so we see a shift in IS from IS G0 E0 to IS G1 E0. We have now moved to point one, where there is higher interest rate and higher income. The increase in interest rate means that there is an improvement in capital account, and the increase in income leads to a deterioration of the current account. The higher interest rate means that there is excess demand for domestic currency, and so there is an appreciation in domestic currency leading to a fall in E from E0 to E1. This has an effect on both the IS and BP curves, the IS curve shifting left from IS G1 E0 to IS G1 E1, and the BP curve shifting up from BP E0 to BP E1. We have now moved from point 1 to point 2, and there has been a fall in interest rate from R1 to R2, and a fall in income from Y1 to Y2. Since overall there has been an increase in interest rate from R0 to R2, this means that the capital account is improved, and so the current account has to have deteriorated for the balance of payments to still equal zero. So overall, there is an appreciation of the nominal exchange rate, an increase in the level of income, increase in the real interest rate, and a deterioration in the current account. Lastly, let's look at one case where there are fixed exchange rates, specifically a monetary expansion with imperfect capital mobility. 
With startup position 0, there is an increase in domestic credit from DC0 to DC1. This leads to a shift right in LM from LM DC0 FX0 to LM DC1 FX0, and so we move to point 1. So we can see there has been a fall in interest rate from R0 to R1, and an increase in income from Y0 to Y1. The fall in interest rate should cause demand for domestic currency to fall, and hence there should be a depreciation. But instead, the central bank intervenes, and by buying domestic currency and selling foreign reserves, so FX falls from FX0 to FX1. This causes the LM curve to shift back from LM DC1 FX0 to LM DC1 FX1, and we are back at point zero. So we can see overall that when under a fixed exchange rate regime, a monetary expansion has no effect on the interest rate or the level of income. It only affects the composition of money supply, since there is now an increase in domestic credit and a decrease in foreign reserves. We haven't covered every case here, so why don't you try the rest yourself? This has been a quick summary of the Monday.